Well, hey, you're here, and I'm thankful for that. This is week six of Bold. We're, we're walking through some stories in Acts, this, this unpacking of what the Holy Spirit had to do through the life of the church, the first church, the early church, the coming out of the gates church. And so this is what we've been walking through, trying to grab a hold of this reoccurring theme of boldness. That this is the stuff that we are made of. That when we step into the story of the gospel, when we accept Christ and we bring him into our life and we claim him as the one who saves us, as the one who leads us, here's what happens. He puts this in our DNA. The boldness is a part of who we are. It's the stuff that we're made of. Then God calls us to take risks. He calls us to lean into moments, not lean out away from moments. And we do that with boldness because he goes with us. It's because he's put this in us. And I, know, I don't know whether if you were with us last week or not, but didn't Kelsey do a great job last week? Yeah, yeah. And if you missed it, you can grab it on the app. Um, I, I literally, I would just tell you, grab, grab it, watch it. I know for me, um, it was literally just two weeks ago, five years ago, um, that Kelsey, you do the math on that, right? That Kelsey got baptized. And so I'm like the proud dad sitting in the back just thinking about all the life um, that I've got to see a front row seat to know that like she's like teaching us and leading us now. And I just think that's remarkable, okay? And so if you missed last week, I would hope that you'd grab some time, grab a hold of it in the app. But she did a great job helping us understand how loving looks like serving. That the bold love is hard work, but it's worth it work. And then it costs us something simply because it costs Jesus something. And so tonight, we're just going to build off of that and pick up the story where she kind of left off because it just continues, again, with this reoccurring, ever-growing sequence of boldness. That the church is continuing to expand, the continuing to, to grow and reach out. And at the same time, it's walking through some pretty crazy stuff. And so the church, the, the, the people of God, they are crying out for God to give them boldness. They're making these requests. And at the same time, they're exercising what God is giving them. They're living a bold life. But the church is leaning into their moments. They're not leaning out of their moments. And so just where we wrapped up this last week in Acts chapter 6, if you've got your Bibles, that's what we're going to jump in with. In chapter 6, it's in verse 7. Where we read, the, where, where we, we hit this just to wrap it up last week, where God's message was preached in every widening circle. That after this food pantry is started and everything like that, it says that God's message was preached in every widening circle and that the number of believers grew incre greatly increased in Jerusalem and that even Jewish priests were choosing Jesus. And it's because they're setting anchor in Jesus, they're boldly walking with Jesus, they're living life on the edge. Of glory. Um, but as you thought, some of you caught that. Yeah. I'm on the edge, right? Um, good heavens, what a mess. But as the story unfolds, here's what, here's what we're going to see. And this is, I think, going to frame some of our time. Following Jesus comes at a cost. Following Jesus always comes at a cost. Even as many of them are jailed, they are arrested, they are beaten, some of them even killed. The church continues to advance. The church continues to grow, even in the midst of what they're walking through. And that even while everything in their life is up for grabs, while everything, they have nothing else to hold on to, this is what I love about the church. Jesus remains enough. And that truth for them is ever-present, our reality, and is true for us now. Jesus remains enough. And so tonight... As we look closer at this dimension of surrender, this idea of ceasing, ceasing to fight against an, an authority. Sometimes we put it in war terms when we think of surrender, but we're going we're gonna to frame this up a little bit here. And I want us to think through these questions. And so these are probably worth writing down if you're taking notes. But it's simply this, to ask yourself, when is Jesus enough? Like, when is Jesus enough? That when all you have is Jesus, is he all that you need? So we're going to dig in here, all right, with those questions in mind. In, uh, in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, it says that Stephen, the guy we were talking about this last week, a man full of God's grace and power, says that he performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. Okay, so this dude is doing miracles. He did not just start a food pantry. He starts doing miracles. And at this point, every, all the people that were doing the super rad like miracle stuff, they were all the apostles. 
But don't forget the way we wrapped up this last week. They laid hands on him. They prayed, on him, prayed over him. And they commissioned him. They ordained him for ministry. And so this man who is full of the Holy Spirit, he is doing what God has commissioned him to do. And that is to bring life to people through miracles and to point people back to who Jesus is. Well, some guys start talking trash to him. And they come up to him in the, in the synagogue area, in the temple area, and they just start running in their mouth. Anybody have anybody in their life that just does that? A few of you. The rest of you are like, no, my life is completely without conflict. I have no one running their mouth in my life. I, I, don't, I don't believe you. Um, I don't believe you. But here's what happens. These guys, they come up, and they just start running their mouth, and they want to debate him. They want to start seeing what he knows and what he doesn't know. And in verse 10, I love this. It says that because they learn pretty quickly that they can't hang with Stephen. They learn pretty quickly that they can't. They can run their mouth a little bit, but it is not going to do anything but embarrass them in front of everyone. And in verse 10, it says that they couldn't hold their ground, that they couldn't stand up to the wisdom against the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spoke. So every time that they're trying to run their mouth and trying to debate him, the wisdom and the spirit that is in all of Stephen's words are just shutting them down and it ticks them off. And so what do they do? The only way that they know how to fight back is to start rounding up other people and tell some lies and have them bring about some questioning of his character and his motives. And so all these people just start lying about Stephen and they go to the high council and they're, they're, they're making a case that he has committed blasphemy. And they're saying that he's speaking against the temple and against Moses. And in Jewish culture, that is a big, big no-no. Now, let me give some clarity about what blasphemy is, okay? Because this is a word that sometimes we will get confused on what it means. And here's, this is really important. Blasphemy is to knowingly attribute an act of God to the enemy, okay? This is a resolve in one's heart to refuse to give God the glory and the credit for doing what only God can do but you know that you're doing it. You can't accidentally blaspheme, okay? And so this is what is un unfolding right here. And so he gets arrested and he gets brought before the high council. And this guy, all of them, everybody's huddled up around. They're all kind of coming in on him with this and they charge him with this, with this crime, okay? And basically it's just a kangaroo court. They're just trying to rally around him because they want to shut this down. And so in verse 15, I love this. In verse 15, it says this, at this point, everyone in the council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. I love that. His face was as bright as an angel. Do you guys know anybody who's got a face as bright as an angel? Guys, some of you are like, she's so dreamy. Like you're thinking of somebody. Yeah, don't creep him out. Okay. Anybody use that line last week? Like, hey, you look like an angel. Right? Nobody? Good. All right, that's good. <laughs> We've come a long way, gang. All right? That's a whole other sermon series. But every eye is on Stephen because the dude's face is like, like glowstone. Minecraft, anybody? Like I, I, if I could build everything in glowstone, I would, okay? But like his face is glowing. So all these people that are taking issue with Stephen, they can't take their eyes off of him because his face is glowing, okay? So I just... That's, that's really important. And you're like, Ben, move on. But no, that's crazy, okay? So the high priest accuses him and he says, are these things true? And the whole chapter of seven, there's a huge, I mean, Stephen just says, okay, here's my window to respond. And Stephen just unloans. He just, just I mean, just totally lit into them with this entire like monologue about Israel's history, about their relationship with God all the way back to Abraham and how everything leads up to the fulfillment of all of this in Jesus. And he's telling this whole, whole story. And I just, it's the whole thing. And I, it's amazing. But I just kind of imagine all of chapter seven. As Stephen is with his like super awesome, angelic, glowing, glowstone face. And he's not even coming up for air. Like he's just rattling it all off. And they're not expecting this. But in chapter seven, verse 51, it takes a turn, Okay. He moves from a history lesson to make his final point. And let me, let me read this. this. This is what happens next. Again, he's in front of the high council and he says, you stubborn people. He says, you stiff-necked people. Okay? If you don't know what that means, that's an insult. Okay? <laughs> he says, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. 
must you forever resist the Holy Spirit. But your ancestors did, and so do you. So do you. Name, name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, though you received it from the hands of angels. This is like a, okay? Like he just totally like punches, I'm gonna die here. Um, He totally just punches them in the face with this. And immediately they are in. Infuriated. They're like foaming at the mouth mad, okay? They start, they start yelling. It's kind of that like, la, 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 la. They literally cover their ears and close their eyes and just start yelling so that they can't hear what he's saying. Have you ever had anyone do that to you? Or have you ever had somebody that you're like, I want to do that to them? Anybody? Keontae's like, yes, amen, yes, right? We have those people in our lives sometimes. But they, they are furious, And he knows this, but he's so laser focused on Jesus. He's so laser focused. He knows that he has all that he needs because he has Jesus. And in this moment, he looks to heaven while they're covering their ears and they're trying to just shut him down and scream him out. They, They rush at him and they drag him out of the city with intent to stone him. The reason why is because you can't kill somebody in town. So they drag him out of town so that they can stone him to death there. And in verse 58, that's what they do. And it says this, the official witnesses, they laid their coats at the feet of a young dude named Saul. That's a pretty important detail because they go on to kill him. And Stephen, even, even not only as the first martyr of the church, Stephen is, everyone is witnessing this. But in his dying breath, He says this, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And they keep throwing rocks. And he looks to heaven and he says, don't hold this against them. His last words were, don't hold this against them. Pretty similar to what we hear when we look when Christ died on the cross. Because he recognizes they have no idea what they're doing. And it comes back to that question that I wanted us to frame the night with, and that is, when is Jesus enough? Like when all you have is Jesus, do you recognize that he's all that you need? Because Stephen, Stephen knew he had all he needed because he had Jesus. And I'm hoping that you can see the boldness in this because I know for us, we can't hardly imagine ever being in a situation like this. We can't hardly imagine ever being in a situation where, where someone is so against us that we're in a physical altercation of this kind. I mean, I know sometimes we'll, just, we'll get our feelings hurt if somebody doesn't like something that we posted, right? I mean, we get our feelings hurt when, when somebody says something like, that wasn't very nice, right? Right, that's what we do. Like, we, we are so sensitive to so many things. And this situation is so foreign to us. It's hard to even put ourselves there. But I think this is important because Stephen was prepared to die for Jesus because he had already surrendered his life to Jesus. He was prepared to die for Jesus because he had already surrendered his life to Jesus. And this is what we have to grab a hold of. A bold life is a surrendered life. A bold life is a surrendered life. And I want us to define surrendered this way. It is to yield to an authority beyond yourself. It is to submit and yield to an authority beyond yourself. Sometimes when we think of surrendering, we think about ceasing resistance we think like I was saying before in in war terms of like we give up or we give in but we're forfeiting control of some kind to surrender is to to yield to another's authority and so a bold life is a surrendered life and Stephen had surrendered his life to the only one who who had made his life he surrendered his life to the only one who knew what to do with his life and it's because a bold life is a surrendered life and it screams the answer to that question That he trusts Jesus to be enough. He trusts Jesus to be enough. And so here's what happens as we read on. It gets more and more intense. The scope of persecution only increases. And at the same time, the extent of the witness as people are responding to the gospel and sharing about Jesus, it increases as well. It's like both take quantum leaps. As, As the persecution increases, so does the church, okay? And so then this happens in chapter 8. 
just in the following verses, it says this. Saul was one of the official witnesses at the killing of Stephen, the dude that they laid their coats at his feet. And it says in chapter, chapter 8, a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles fled into Judea and Samaria. Some godly men came and buried Stephen with loud weeping. And Saul was going everywhere to devastate the church. It says he went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into jail. When this word, this word devastate, it literally, the imagery here, this is what the word means. Like a wild animal mangling their prey. That's what the word means. So the vigor in which he is on this mission is intense. But in, in verse four, it says, but the believers who had fled Jerusalem went everywhere, preaching the good news about Jesus. So the dude, Saul, who approved the death of Stephen, he proceeds wreaking havoc. He proceeds to try and come after all of these believers, all of these followers of the way. They're not called Christians yet. There's not like church buildings yet. This is, this is literally just people that have claimed Jesus as the one who saves, and he is coming after all of them, and they scatter, and they grow because they preach Jesus. And so the plan was to destroy the church. That was his plan, but it grew. And all through chapter 8, more and more adventures unfold. And it wasn't just Stephen who then had the power to heal people. The dude, the sidekick, one of the other, the seven dudes that they started the food pantry with, Philip, he starts healing people too, all kinds of crazy stuff. And here's a little shout out for the app. If you got the app and you want to go back and catch some old sermons, we did a series through some of the stories right here in a, in a series called Party Starters, okay? So you can learn more about that later. But we're going to skip to chapter 9. Because in verse 1, it gets intense. He sa it says that he continued uttering murderous threats with every breath. That this is what Saul was bent on doing. He was pursuing everyone with that intent. He was determined to destroy the followers of the way. And they couldn't just go, the Pharisees couldn't just go and start rounding people up. They had to have authority from the high council. And so that's what he did. They, they, he goes to the high council. They give him authority. It's like giving him a sheriff's badge. It's like the wild, wild west kind of a thing. Like they give him permission to go start pursuing people and rounding them up and taking them back. And it's because he's trying to take them out. And it even says that his plan is to arrest and bring them back in chains. And the reason why is because they all scattered. So to him, he's going out of Jerusalem with intent to round up everyone who left so that this is not going to spread any further. But everything's about to change. And it's so significant that Luke, the writer of Acts, he's so detail-oriented. He captures this story two more times in Acts. And if you want to grab some more um, context, chapter 22 and chapter 26, you can circle back where Paul is speaking. Then Paul, now Saul, right? He's speaking of this. And so here's what happens in chapter 9. Let me read this. So he's on a mission. He's on a mission. And he says, as he was nearing Damascus on this mission, a brilliant light from heaven suddenly became, beamed down upon him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, sir? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what to do. It says that the men with Saul stood speechless with surprise, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. It says that as Saul picked himself up off the ground, he found that he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days, and all that time he went without food and water. Okay, that's pretty wild, okay? Like if you just take that in for a moment, he's on a road trip to 150 miles away to a place called Damascus. And while he's on the way with the mission to round up the followers of the way, bright light beaming in his face, knocks him off his horse, he falls to his knees and he starts hearing a voice. And he doesn't know who the voice is. And this voice is telling him, why are you persecuting me? 
because everything you're doing to everybody else, you're doing it to me. And he has no idea who he is, but the voice tells him, I'm Jesus. And I can't imagine, I can't imagine like how intense of a moment this is and how disoriented he would have been. But the first thing Jesus tells him to do is get up and get moving and get to town. And everyone that he's traveling with, they're speechless. They don't know how to process this moment because it says that they see the light and they hear the sound of someone's voice, but they don't see Paul in, or Saul, Saul, excuse me, Saul, Paul, this guy's name changed. I'm going to make a mess of it, okay? They don't know what he's doing. They just see him interacting with someone because they hear a voice, but they don't know that it's Jesus. They can't process all of this. And so what they do is they just help him get to the town because he's blind. And this is what we have to know about Saul. He's like a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's like the Pharisee of Pharisees. He is so focused on law. He so dedicated his life and, and set his devotion and dedication to the law. Dare I say, surrendered his life to the law. That he's bent on this. And all of the steps that he's been taking, he's doing it with the mindset that he's being faithful to the God that he's serving. He's doing this with the mindset and determination that he is going to stop these people from talking about Jesus. He's not pursuing them because he wants better answers. He's pursuing them because he doesn't want their answers. He's confident he's on the right track and everything he surrendered his life to, everything he has yielded to and given authority to in his life, all of it just like imploded. Every bit of it. Everything that he's been taught. You remember when we were talking in Acts chapter 5 about Gammy? Remember Gammy trying to shut down the whole high council being like, guys, before you beat them up and kill them, like let this play out a little bit because every other time somebody causes a stir, Rome takes them out. Well, it turns out Gammy, Gammy is the dude who taught Saul everything that he knows. And it turns out Gammy was right because in this moment, Saul is learning He's on the wrong side of the fight. He's on the wrong side of things. That the God that he's been studying, the God that he's been pursuing, the God that he's been praying to and singing to and thinking of the whole time with this righteous indignation, defending and serving, this God that has promised that he would come and rescue his people, he's done so in person. And that person is Jesus. And his mind can't process this. And it's because he's come face to face with Jesus. Everything that he's pursued in life suddenly means nothing. Absolutely nothing. This, this is Saul's conversion. And it's quite dramatic. It's quite dramatic moment. Because his whole world is flipped upside down and turned inside out. And the implications are huge. And they're huge for us too. Because Jesus completely turns his life around. And I want us to learn this. This is something to take note of in this. Surrender requires bold vulnerability. Bold vulnerability. Jesus, Jesus isn't interested in pieces of you. He wants all of you. He's not interested in you handing out this part of your life and that part of your life and keeping some of it to yourself. He wants every bit of it. And he's the only one who knows what to do with every bit of it. Because I know that sometimes we just love to be king. We want to be in charge. We want to be in control. And if, there's, if you miss anything else I'm saying, you need to hear this. Jesus isn't interested in making you a better king for your kingdom. He's not interested in being king of your kingdom. Jesus is king. And this is his kingdom. And he invites us into it. And this choice to choose Jesus, this was a dramatic one. And for some of us, maybe when we think back to our story, we're like, I wasn't running around hating everybody and trying to take people out. But maybe your point of surrendering to Jesus was a dramatic one. Maybe it was a subtle one. I'm just the guy who says it's a necessary one. There's all kinds of steps in between and it takes boldness to admit that we're heading in the wrong direction and to turn to surrender our lives to Jesus. And so maybe a question for you right now is, where might you be struggling to live surrendered? 
Maybe you've given Jesus so many pieces of yourself, but there's just some corners that you just really want to hang on to. Maybe there's some pieces that you are pretty sure you're good at it. Like you got it covered and you don't need his help in this part of your life. And some of us, we remember making those choices and we are past the fallout from them. Some of us, maybe they're right around the corner. Jesus wants all of you, not some of you. But Paul, he's struck blind. He's totally disoriented. The physical effect of this would have been devastating. Like he, he doesn't even know how to move. Like, I mean, I, I think there's so much shock in what's happened. The spiritual impact of it, though, is even greater because it changes the course of human history. He was physically blind and he was spiritually blind. Don't miss the metaphor, okay? But he was so spiritually bankrupt. And I think maybe what we can learn in this is that that's where we are when we come face to face with Jesus. Because you don't save yourself. And the harder we try to, the more we miss so maybe a question for you tonight is how clearly can you see your need for a savior? How clearly can you see your need for a savior? Because we, we see surrender in Stephen's life. We see surrender in Saul's life, soon to be Paul's life. And there's another character we got to highlight here. His name is Ananias. And all we know of this cat, all we know of this cat is that he was, he was in Damascus and he was a believer and that he was pretty serious about hearing God's voice. That's what we learn pretty quickly is like he's, he's in tune and he even obeys God when it's pretty dangerous. And so he has this, this vision with God where God tells him, hey, like put it in your GPS. It's on State Street or Straight Street actually. And tells him like, hey, you need to head this way. There's a dude named Saul there. I want you to go hang out with him. And <laughs> excuse me, I'm dying up here. My, my face feels like it's about to explode right now. Um, Sinus pressure, I apologize. But Ananias is like, wait, what? He's like, you want me to do what? Like, I know about this guy. People talk about this guy because he's rounding us up and killing us and putting us in prison. You want me to go hang out with him? And God is like, yeah, that's what I want you to do. And it's because this guy will be the guy that tells the world about me. And so Ananias obeys in verse 17. That's what he does. And let me read this. Just a few verses here. It says, Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you may get your sight back and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and was strengthened. That's why when anyone gets baptized, you're supposed to go out to eat. I was joking. I was joking. But it's never a bad idea to go out to eat. I'm really hungry right now, okay? Here's what I don't want us to miss. A surrendered life is an obedient life. Ananias was faithful. And he came up to this. Do I trust Jesus to be enough? Do I trust him to be enough? Do I trust Jesus to boldly obey, to go hang out with a dude who's killing us. A surrendered life is an obedient life, and bold surrender is bold obedience. There's boldness in all this, and here's the thing. Paul's life, it was dramatically altered when he encountered Christ, and it led to obedience, and Jesus gave him pretty, pretty quick requirements that demanded that he trust and obey. Because that's what bold surrender looks like when you come face to face with Jesus. And here's, here's something else I don't think we can miss. At the point of surrender, we are repurposed for a new mission. Saul had a mission, and he was living a certain way on a certain path, and it was all about destruction and harm to everyone else, and he did not realize he was the enemy. And I think sometimes we find ourselves there, but my mind goes to like, you ever watch those videos of like ships that they sink, like when they retire a ship, whether it's a battleship or a warship or like, I don't know, Bubba's shrimp ship. I don't know. Like, you ever seen these videos where like they just cut holes in the bottom and then it just sinks 
and they use it so like, like fishies can come hang out. It's like a coral reef and stuff. Anybody, you've never seen these videos? No. Okay, there are ships, all right? And they make videos of people sinking them, all right? You're like, oh, okay, yeah. All right. And here's where I'm going with this. You have to let your ship sink because he wants to give it new purpose. That means this, we surrender everything, all of our identity, all of the things that we think make us who we are, all of those feelings that our culture is telling us this is who you are because this is how you feel without any science or biology or anything to support anything. We are so caught up in how we want to be known and how we choose how we are known. And we are so committed to independence. And Jesus never calls us to that. He calls us to interdependence. And it's time to sink the ship. Because sometimes, some of us, we got holes, but we're still paddling, trying to stay afloat. Some of us, we're so committed to just saying, no, I've got this, I've got this. Nobody else needs to help me that we're missing what needs to happen. All of our identity is repurposed when we give our lives to Jesus. Everything that we have allowed to define us comes under the Lordship when we surrender to Christ. And the early church understood that because following Jesus comes at a cost. And later, Paul writes this in Philippians 3, because Saul becomes Paul. And he starts planting churches and going around and telling more people about Jesus because that's what happens next. He just immediately starts preaching, okay? But in chapter 3 of Philippians, the letter to the church there, it says this, and I want you to hear this loudly and clearly. It says, And zealous, yes, in fact, I harshly persecuted the church, and I obeyed the Jewish law so carefully that I was never accused of any fault. I once thought all these things were so very important. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I may have Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own goodness or my ability to obey God's law, but I trust Christ to save me for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. And as a result, I can really know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I can learn what it means to suffer with him, sharing in his death so that somehow I can experience the resurrection from the dead dead. Everything else is considered complete loss when compared to knowing Christ. Everything to have the life God wants us to have, this resurrection life, the old has to go. The old has to go to make room for the new. And this Saul becomes Paul in just a few chapters. And he went from being an enemy to a chosen vessel. And he went from presiding over the persecution and the murder, the deaths of believers to writing 13 books of the New Testament. And I want us to know this, if God can change this heart of a fierce opponent into the most willing servant, I believe he can, he can save anybody. Everything that he'd been taught came true and destroyed and put back together. Again, do you believe that he can do that with you? And do you believe that he can do that with those around you? Are you living a resurrected life? Because there's a difference. Because a bold life is a surrendered life, and a surrendered life is an obedient life. Where is he calling you to surrender? Because I think God wants to repurpose all of us. And that means our ship needs to sink. When is Jesus enough? And when all you have is Jesus, is he all you need? Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for what you do with it. And we pray, God, that our hearts be open to what you have to say to us through it. Father, our hearts sometimes are all over the place. Our minds are sometimes all over the place. 
all over the place. Help our hearts look to you and trust you and lean in on you. And God, sink our ship and repurpose it for how you want it to be. Because with new life comes new mission. We pray for that. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.